Welcome back to my ecological analysis of the Kanto region, as it's seen in red, blue, yellow, leaf green, and fire red. Today I'll be looking at Mount Moon and the adjacent routes, so basically Pewter City to Cerulean City. This is the second part of the series, so here's a quick catch up on the relevant points I argued last time, if you need a reminder or just couldn't be bothered to watch the first one. I kind of glossed over this last time, but I want to go over my full thoughts on it and explain how I rationalize it, and that is Pokemon Evolution. Pokemon Evolution is obviously a misnomer for varying forms of development. As creatures grow, they change physiologically, basic stuff. Evolution just simplifies that into a single moment, and turns what would be a smooth gradient for many species into discrete stages. This is another interpretation from the abstraction. From the perspective of designing a game, well-defined stages are just a lot easier and more useful to implement. Not all evolutions are this gradient though. With Pokemon that go through very significant changes, like the Viridian Forest Bugs, it's of course representing complete metamorphosis. These changes would happen over a short period of time, so the discrete forms fit better. Often we can see the difference in these two categories from other aspects of the Pokemon. The bugs go through massive stat changes between forms and have very different move pools. Meanwhile, the birds mainly just get across the board of stat increases, and their move pools mostly stay the same. So now for the hard part. I want to draw a connection between age and evolving, and there's a group of Pokemon that will help me show that. Gakuna, or any of the other Chrysalis Pokemon, shouldn't really be able to evolve in the wild. With training as we know it, Kakuna would be stuck with Heart and, and just sitting in front of enemy Pokemon, unable to fight them and gain XP. Beedrill shouldn't be able to exist, and we could technically argue that since we don't see Beedrill here, but there are other games where they do exist in the wild, like Gold, Silver, and Crystal. So no matter what, they can be evolved into in the wild. And again, due to our sampling method, just because we don't see them here doesn't mean they don't exist here. We can only confirm the Pokemon that we do see are here. There has to be some way that these Pokemon can naturally evolve in the wild. Training and experience is just sort of a shortcut. It can epigenetically induce development. This is supported by the fact that we see evolved Pokemon in the wild of lower level than their evolution should allow. These Pokemon evolved due to aging. From this, I feel confident in saying that these level-based evolutions are simply the natural aging of the Pokemon. Level is simply a measure of the Pokemon's strength, which can come from aging or training. But... Non-level evolutions can get a little bit weirder. I already dropped an important keyword, epigenetic. Epigenetics is basically the study of the variability of expression of genes based on environmental factors. Think rabbits having whiter coats in colder weather to better blend in with snow, or a Pokemon developing down different branches based on being exposed to different materials. It's a magified but not completely outlandish version of the real life thing. In terms of specific examples that can relate to Pokemon, there are species like axolotls which are pedomorphic, meaning that they retain many juvenile traits that their ancestors metamorphosized out of. Under certain conditions, which can be induced by humans, they will go through metamorphosis and become full adults. That's what some of these non-level evolutions could be. Former forms induced by, whether purposeful or not, human intervention. Alternatively, a very different potential real-life evolution is Locust's change between Solitary and Gregarious forms, which is onset by a number of different factors and results in changes to the animal's behavior and physiology. Certain evolutions, or in particular branched evolutions, could do something similar. The point is to say that evolution as it exists can make sense through the lens of our world's biology, with level representing natural development, and stone trade or other evolutions representing more specific conditions, inducing epigenetic change. So as we go forward, there's going to be a lot of Pokemon's evolutionary lines that I just don't acknowledge, and that's likely because it's just a gradient change of incomplete metamorphosis that is not particularly interesting. Pidgey, for example, kind of just get bigger with added display features, likely for attracting mates, and Ratatat get bigger and go from this thin purple juvenile hair, or perhaps that skin, to a thick adult brown coat. Neither of them are particularly worthy of note, they're just the natural development of the Pokemon. Also, for many species, we don't see the fully evolved Pokemon in the wild, but for most of those, I think we have to assume that they do exist out there, we just don't see them. And as I said last time, by the nature of our sampling method, we can only confirm that the species we see are there, Theoretically, there could be a lot of other Pokemon there that we just don't see. 
We left off at Route 3, which I did mention last time for its unique property of being the only place in the whole region where Pidgey and Spiro cohabitate. As I described, this strongly suggests that the two exclude each other, so why is this area the exception? The Pokedex suggests that Pidgey live in forests, while Spiro live in mountainous regions, and at a glance this may seem to track with what we see, but there are some notable oddities. Spiro have a presence on the bike path and on Route 11, neither of which have any mountains near them, unless you count Diglett Tunnel, which is not much of a mountain. Route 11 in particular is far more of a forest, but no Pidgey. What these regions do have is a significant human impact. The bike path is a bike path, and Route 11 has plenty of people around it. This gave me the idea that Spiro might be better urban adapters than Pidgey. Most of the areas where Pidgey dominate seem to be more minimally human affected, even if close to urban areas. This somewhat comes down to the interpretation of the areas. To me, for example, Route 6 seems like a simple path through green space, whereas Route 11 seems more like a human-controlled park. This is mainly from the types of people we see there, and just kind of the looks of the paths. Even if so, how would this explain Route 3? Well, Pewter City is a city, implying it to be significantly larger than the towns to the south, and it slammed right into the middle of a forested area. Perhaps the city displaced the Pidgey and forced them to move up the mountain. They don't then outcompete the Spiro because of the latter's ability to exploit the newly created human environment. A number of factors could result in this differing ability to adapt to anthropogenic change. These include things like a diet more suited to human waste and certain social behaviors that may give them an edge. But overall, I hypothesize that Spiro will fare better in more urban areas than Pidgey. So Jigglypuff live at Route 3 most of the time. Their lack of any notable offensive moves until at earliest level 34 suggests to me that their moves take on a defensive role and aren't important for getting food. This means that they're either herbivorous or omnivorous, where the omni comes from invertebrates or other small animals. Seeing as a straightforward defensive mechanism, put a predator to sleep and give yourself a chance to escape. Defense Curl can obviously increase your defense, Disable can stall out a Predator's offense, Rest can allow you to quickly recover from a fight, they're very much specialized for defense. Their narrow habitat suggests that they either aren't very successful or their niche is very small. But there's a good reason that if they were to survive anywhere, it'd be here. That being Mount Moon and the Moonstones that probably come from there. Mount Moon is distinctly the place where you do find multiple Moonstones after all and all the species who evolve from it live around here. Whether they need to find a fully formed stone, or if the properties are more broadly found throughout Mount Moon and thus more consistently encourage the growth of such creatures, being around Mount Moon likely promotes their development. If a Jigglypuff does manage to become a fully fledged Wigglytuff, then that's a big edge for them, more ability to defend themselves and their family from predators. There's not too much else to say for the Puffs, but we'll get into them as prey when we get to what probably eats them. Here we see male and female Nidorans kind of taking turns existing here, unlike the more mixed presence of Route 21, which is what made me interpret it as their breeding ground. Despite being separated by sexes, the females, at least, are very likely social animals and live in groups. This is because they have a very unique trait among Pokémon of losing the ability to mate with development, with Nidorina and Queens not being able to reproduce. This may at a glance seem unusual, but it's more familiar than you'd think. This is menopause, and it has some distinct benefits. Later aged pregnancies can greatly risk a female's health, so simply not allowing that to happen lets them live longer. And most of the benefits of that come from a social context, where the older females can help the group. If you want to learn more about this, you can look into the grandmother hypothesis. The gist of it is that there's a great advantage to having older females around. They can help find food and raise young, and in the case of Nita Queens, definitely protect their young. So they develop to live past their breeding age. I've also already discussed why the Nidos would want to come here. Same as Jigglypuff. A Nidorino or Nidorina growing and potentially becoming a Nido King or Queen would be a great benefit for their ability to both attract a mate and defend their families. Notably, if the menopause only took place in Nido Queen, there might be some disadvantage to it. But because Nidorina can't reproduce, it's only an upgrade. And the loss of reproduction is then definitely a consistent characteristic and not just some sort of radiation poisoning from the moonstones. <laughs> One last question I don't have a good answer for is their group structure. Because menopause would allude to a group structure similar to that of killer whales. 
in which it is female dispersed, that being the females leave the group once they come of age. But the big separation between the two sexes makes me think more of elephants, which don't go through menopause, probably because they're male dispersed. So maybe we just have something completely unique going on here that can't quite be explained with real life counterparts. Like at Route 22, Mankey have a trend of existing during fire red, leaf green, and yellow, with gaps in blue and red. I tried to explain this last time with Poliwag, and while I still think Mankey do prey upon them, for their support coming from their ability Insomnia, making them immune to Poliwag's hypnosis, there's no pond here, and the numbers for Poliwag I used last time were flaky anyways. After glancing further ahead, the trend of Mankey population seems to be migrating between the areas around Saffron City, in red, and out of Kanto, in blue. Rather than the goal, their locations during leaf green, fire red, and yellow may simply be an in-between for this larger migration. So we'd expect to see the real draw for Mankey in their presence during red. They still do have to eat here though, and once again Ratatat and at Route 3, Jigglypuff make good prey due to typing. Jigglypuff in particular can't make use of their iconic sing due to Mankey's aforementioned insomnia. They still have Spiro and Nidoran to contend with, and Pidgey also potentially don't make very good prey, all for similar typing reasons. They also share space with Sandshrew, and while they don't have a type advantage, Sandshrew do have very high defenses, making them hard for the monkeys to break through. They also get Poison Sting, which for any predator that isn't immune to poison means attacking them is a big risk, as they could get poisoned and eventually incapacitated. Sandshrew aren't out of the question, they just likely aren't Mankey's first choice. Jumping over to Route 4, Mankey coexist with Ekans as well during Fire Red, and that likely works out the same way as with Nidoran. Ekans resist their attacks and risk poison, so again, unideal. Mankey don't really have much in the ways of adaptation to get around these issues. They've got normal moves or seismic toss for the poison types, and Leer and Screech to potentially get through Sancher's defense, but the omnipresent poison can somewhat limit their options, especially with Spear around that may make an easy meal out of a poison incapacitated Mankey. Despite it being level based, there's something interesting to say about Mankey's evolution, its loss of a tail. Likely this is a natural development, and it potentially tells us something about their habitat throughout their life. Mankey likely use their tails to help maneuver around their trees, but the loss of them means that Primeape probably instead live on the ground and don't require such mobility. It's also possible that due to their aggressive nature, it's very likely for Mankey to lose their tails throughout their life, and thus depicting their adult form without them is more accurate. I think the former is more likely, but the latter is also possible. Either way, it does tell us something. It's about time to discuss Sandshrew. Though they're only here during yellow and in small numbers, that is still a presence worthy of discussion. Because this is such a small presence, I'll worry about their migratory habits later. So we'll start with the simple straightforward question of what they eat, which for Sandshrew is a fairly interesting one. To me, the distinct traits that reveal a predator of other Pokemon are moves or other sorts of advantages that make them consistently able to defeat other Pokemon. Type advantage is a big clear factor in this as dealing twice as much damage or taking half as much can make or break a matchup. Beyond that, strong moves and stats can have such an effect, but require particularly high or low values to be impactful. If you have no clear strong type matchups, like with Jigglypuff, that indicates to me that the species is probably herbivorous, or at least just preying on small animals that don't pose much of a challenge. The reason I bring this up, other than to explain my general reasoning for these sorts of things, is that Sandshrew sit kind of on the borderline. They learn no strong ground moves, meaning they're not taking advantage of the strength of their type, or stab. Slash is a decently strong move that they get decently early on at 23 or 17, but it's also the strongest move they get. They do have a good attack stat, comparable to Mankey. And they get Swift, which would only really have an advantage if they had to fight things that raise evasion. In terms of that, the only other options for these areas are Pidgey or other Sandshrew. I guess if they were to hunt Pidgey, that would explain the lack of strong ground moves, but my gut tells me they're insectivores, using their claws to dig up bugs and such. Their high attack stat and moves like Slash just then naturally stem from pectoral strength and strong tools that are for digging. Most of their moveset beyond that screams defense. Defense curl, sand attack, poison from poison sting, high defense, and sandville. But Swift is still bothering me. Sand Tomb as well, it's a trappy move which alludes to offense and having to prey on things. However, it could simply be that whatever small creatures they do prey on are particularly fast and hard to catch. 
Swift could then help them hit such things, and Sandtomb might be able to help them prevent escaping. So without a better explanation for such moves, I'll go with that for now. It's time to finally delve into Mount Moon, an interesting place with four new Pokémon. Let's start with the most common, Zubat. In terms of their frequency between games, it's mostly consistent, with the exception of the middle floor during Leaf Green and Fire Red. However, that clearly has something to do with Paris, as they take over there. So I'll leave it at they just seem to be excluded from there, and talk about it more during Paris. For Predators and Prey, going by type advantage, we have a nice example of each. Wing Attack and Air Cutter are very effective against Paris, and thus would make it very easy prey. Leech Life and Poison Fang, while less effective, could also help out on this front. Paris on paper pose the same risk as many other species before. They have Poison Powder and Effect Spore, risking the status conditions that could hamper the Zubat, if not for their Poison Typing. It's actually quite interesting. Why are Zubat Poison Type? They only get one Poison Type move, and that's only late in Gen 3. And for offensive purposes, Flying should be doing them just fine. No, it seems most likely that their Poison Typing is defensive, to remove the risk of getting poisoned by something like Paris's defense. They can still be paralyzed or put to sleep by Paris, but neither is as much of a risk as poison. By the language of the game mechanics, sleep is short, only lasting a couple moments. And while paralyzed may last longer and is hampering, it's not as much of a death sentence. A paralyzed Zubat may still be able to fly away and find a place to hide and recover, as opposed to falling unconscious from poison and being preyed upon by whatever opportunist comes along. This actually fits pretty well with things we see in real life. A lot of poisonous species are poisonous because they eat other things that are poisonous. Though not poison type, Paris have many poisonous traits. Rather than a developed trait, Zubat's poison could simply be a combination of a grown resistance to poison and a poisonous diet. Zubat getting both Supersonic and Confuse Ray gives clear evidence that confusion is something very useful for them. There's not any particularly interesting uses for it though, beyond confused prey are easier to catch and confused predators are easier to escape. There are a few more moves that are somewhat interesting on Zubat though. Haze is an odd one. Paris don't get any boosting moves, only Geodude and Clefairy do here. As I'll go into in a moment, Geodude likely aren't ideal targets, so this could only really be used for getting around Clefairy's growls, defense curls, cosmic powers, and minimizes. Mean Look is another odd one. Due to fleeing from wild Pokemon working based on speed, and just kind of the logic of things, it's safe to assume that speed is the determining factor when it comes to Pokemon escaping from each other in the wild. Hot take, I know. Zubat are the fastest things here though, by a solid margin, so I don't see why trapping would be a massive benefit. It could be for other animals, but there's some other things. Like their ability, inner focus, protecting against flinches. But the only flinching moves are on other Zubat, who have two of them. So unless it's for the off chance of Clefairy pulling a flinch move out of Metronome, the only reason for such an ability would be the widespread interspecies conflict, which could be either cannibalism or more mundane interspecies competition. I suggest cannibalism because of mean look. Generally when you're competing with other members of your species and don't want to eat them, you want them to run away, which mean look does the opposite of. They probably opportunistically cannibalize, but the flinch stuff could easily be some more generic interspecies competition. Probably for food, since if it was sexual selection, we'd expect to see sexual dimorphism. So it seems like Zubat have a wide diet, which would follow if their frequency of being seen correlated with a large population. They'd have to be more generalists to support such high numbers. And if you have a lot of one species, you're bound to get something that'll feed on it. And that here is clearly Geodude. While Rock Throw may be inaccurate, it should be enough to score a few kills on Zubat now and again. And apart from them flying away, there's not too much a Zubat can do to a Geodude. Well, biting it with Bite or Poison Fang actually aren't that bad ideas. Bite being Dark type means it isn't resisted and is special, and Poison Fang can poison, and I think I've stated how valuable I think poison is enough by now. Overall, Geodude probably win fights as against Zubat though, and it isn't a good idea for them to really attack. So why not go a bit more into Geodude now? Like with Zubat, their numbers throughout the game are mostly consistent, with the Paris takeover of Floor 2 pushing them out as well. Rock-type is mostly a great type to be here. It gives them super effective stab against both Zubat and Paris, and also makes them resist the normal attacks of Clefairy and Paris. So most other Pokémon here could be good prey. It seems Zubat are the most prevalent though, so they're likely the primary option. 
but Zubat are much faster than Geodude, so how do they catch them? Well, it's a pretty common line of dialogue to have a character mention that they mistook Geodude for a rock, and this is something that can happen to the player. Using Rock Smash can sometimes lead to you getting into an encounter with a Geodude or Graveler. Their appearance is almost definitely camouflaged to blend in and both avoid predation and to ambush prey. A Geodude can lie in wait, rock in hand, and once a tasty Zubat comes by, it throws it. And as I described, Zubat don't really have that much to counter Geodude, other than just flying away, which should be fairly effective in itself. Pairs are slower and so shouldn't be as easily able to flee. You may be thinking, it's grass type, that sounds like the worst type of prey for a Geodude. And yeah, any grass move would make one crumble, but the only grass move that pairs get in these gens is Giga Drain at level 51. Though the Parasect that do get to that point will make easy work of Geodude, the majority of the Paras pose no such danger. That doesn't mean they're defenseless though, they have status through their ability and through a number of moves including the iconic Spore. Blah blah, poison dangerous, and sleep and paralysis give good opportunities to escape. Clefairy don't pose much of any threat to Geodude other than maybe lucky metronome pulls or later on Meteor Mash, though they also aren't as easily killed as the other prey options both from not being weak to anything Geodude can throw at them, and having good defensive options such as stat boosting moves, Sing, Moonlight, and their ability, Cute Charm. So yeah, Geodude have to put some work in for their food, but there's not too much they have to worry about in terms of death. Until they explode. Self-destruct and explosion are weird moves. Though they don't outright kill the user, but instead incapacitate them, they still are very risky to say the least but there's a couple possible explanations for this sort of behavior. Risking your own safety so drastically can make sense if you're protecting other members of your species that can then pass on your genes for you, such as your children or siblings. If Judo live in families, this could be why they do this. On the other hand, an animal being poisonous doesn't really help it. How sick a predator gets after it eats you isn't going to change the fact that you just got eaten. What it does do is teach the predator that things like you, such as your family and your children, aren't good for eating, so hopefully they'll avoid other creatures similar to you in the future. These moves could have a similar purpose of discouraging predation. This would be really supported if there was some sort of aposematism in them, or display features or coloration that makes them obvious to predators, which allows them to easily tell, oh shit, this is a poisonous slash venomous slash explosive animal, I shouldn't try to eat that. Which we of course see the opposite of, which doesn't mean that it isn't the case, just something worthy of note. The latter makes more sense to me, though the only real predator we see here is Giga Drain Parasects that may exist. Those would actually be able to make quick work of any Geodude or Graveler, but perhaps they don't due to this risk of being blown up. One last Geodude thing, Golem, a trade evolution. I think this one better fits in the axolotl side, of them being neotenous, as in Golem was once the mature form, but it stopped being advantageous to develop in that way. This is mainly down to a visual analysis, which isn't the most reliable source. Judud and Graveler look more like rocks, and both mechanics and narrative support this idea as both can be found via rock smashing. Golem don't quite look as much like rocks. Sure, they look rock-like, but I think even if they could pull their heads and limbs into their body, they'd still be noticeable as a big spherical ball that just kind of looks like it's made out of rocks. The younger forms look like they do a better job of camouflaging in. So, like axolotls, certain factors can then trigger this mostly lost metamorphosis, and they can sometimes turn into the primitive golem form. So, with Paris, I need to get something out of the way real quick. While visually they're of course very likely based on Cordyceps, the parasitic zombie mushroom, in actuality there's little evidence that it works in any sort of similar way. If it was some sort of parasitic disease, then we'd expect to see these pseudoscorpion looking guys walking around without any mushroom, as their own Pokemon, but we don't. All members of this species have the fungus, so it's far more likely to be symbiotic. The arthropod part gets certain abilities such as access to grass moves and status moves like Spore, and the mushroom gets a consistent source of energy from the arthropod's body. This is nothing particularly unusual. Gut bacteria evolve and adapt to the evolving diets of their host species. They get nutrients from the host, but also help break down food to make it easier for them to digest. Paris is a more fantastical version of this, but it's completely plausible, and it better fits what we see than a parasitic mushroom. They likely eat smaller invertebrates in the cave, as they have no particular edge for fighting the other Pokémon until late on. 
For some reason, I want to suggest that they scavenge corpses of other Pokemon, though my evidence for that is somewhat flimsy. Scratch and Slash could help them tear through old stiff flesh, and the mushroom may help them with digestion of decayed flesh, but it could also be that they use the claws to dig around in dirt, and the mushroom helps with digesting fibers and such. So their dominance on floor 2 in Leaf Green and Fire Red. What's that about? Likely this is their breeding time, and pairs group in large numbers in these small tunnels to find mates and compete for them. Aromatherapy as a move suggests that they need to be healed of status effects, and the most abundant source of those is other Paris. So Parasect may heal themselves or their family after interspecies competition. With all the Paras grouped up, it makes sense that Geodude would stay clear, as if any Parasect with Giga Drain are hanging around, they're in trouble. And with numbers on their side, for a Zubat to be put asleep by Spore goes from likely the Paris getting away to the Zubat being torn apart in their sleep by the claws of many Paris. So Paris make an interesting little living here. Oh, and if for whatever reason Paris were to develop an earlier on grass move in the future, we'd expect the Geodude population to get somewhat screwed over. Just like Jigglypuff, Clefairy don't really have much in the way of offensive moves, and instead are almost entirely defensive in nature. Because of that, they're either herbivorous or perhaps prey on insignificant animals. Their defensive strategy against the other denizens of Mount Moon likely revolves around boosting up defensively and outlasting the opponent. They do have a few options that don't quite fit into that mold, these being Encore, Sing, and Follow Me. Well, Encore can fit into it by locking the enemy out of an attacking move, but it takes a bit more logical thinking to make use of that. Perhaps this suggests that Clefairy are decently intelligent? Sing could also be used as extra time to buff up, but if you do put them to sleep, why not just run away? Zubat, due to their speed, may still be able to chase them down after waking up, or it could simply be a delay for other Clefairy to get away, while well, some buff up and hold them off. This would go along with Follow Me, and together lightly suggest that Clefairy live in groups and protect their young. Clefape will fit into this in the same way as the other Moonstone evolutions. Clefairy live here because certain factors encourage their growth to Clefable, and being stronger and more able to defend your family is beneficial. So one last kind of absurd thing. Are they from the moon? In some of the phylogenetic Pokemon trees I've seen, Clefairy have been put into an alien or from space category. While this is probably canon in, like, the anime, there's no evidence for it in the games. The evidence that does exist comes from dialogue and such, and my general opinion on such things is that I trust that NPCs usually aren't lying, but that doesn't mean anything they say is accurate. Any reference to Clefairy coming from space is likely just folklore. And if they did come from the moon, it seems very likely that the nearby, very similar in appearance moveset and evolution, Jigglypuff, would have the same origin. I'd be willing to bet they're almost definitely closely related. So if you think Clefairy are from space, then Jigglypuff are also probably from space. And if you want to say Moonstones entail an extraterrestrial origin, then you also, again, have to include Jigglypuff, but also the Nidos. Which, I mean, they could be closely related anyways. It's possible that all three of their responses to Moonstones is not convergent evolution, but instead a homologous trait. I think it's a fun idea, but I still think the idea of them coming from space is a massive stretch, and instead it's just a cultural idea grown from misunderstood behaviors. So in real life, there are broadly two categories of snakes, constrictors and biters. Ekans have abilities that allude to both. Their level one move is Wrap, which of course suggests constriction. They do get Poison Sting a little later, but it's also their only move that can poison, and of course it isn't particularly damaging. Bite also alludes to biting, and their ability Intimidate, along with moves like Glare, Screech, and Leer, seem to allude towards a threat display, which would allude to venomous real-life counterparts. However, mechanically, all these traits seem very beneficial to a Constrictor, that needs to get close and stay there, so it could kind of go either way. If they really had strong venom, why don't we see them having moves like Poison Fang? Ekans seem to sit in between the two strategies, a not so missing link of sorts. It's easy to see how poison would benefit a constrictor strategy. Bite the target and inject poison and you don't have to spend as much time and energy squeezing them, since the poison is also weakening them. 
Other species that more lean towards biting would have stronger poison attacks and a better attack stat, whereas fully constrictors might have more stat reduction abilities and better defenses. That's my Pokemon snake hypothesis at least. In terms of what they specifically actually eat, probably whatever they can catch, which includes Rattatat, Mankey, and Spearow if they're lucky. With Intimidate, Wrap, and Poison, they should have an advantage in most of these fights. The Pokedex also suggests that they eat bird eggs, which is also highly plausible. There are birds here. And as I've discussed, I believe Spearow don't protect their nests as diligently as Pidgey. So Ekans might join in with Rattatat in sneaking out a few eggs. If further on, Ekans correlated more with Spearow than Pidgey, we'd see a nice little convergence of ideas then. In terms of predators here, as with most things, Adult Raticate and Fero may prey upon weaker Ekans, but there's no clear dominant predator. The final thing is what's going on with their version exclusive counterpart, Sandshrew. Why do they exclude each other? They share Poison Sting, but they really don't scream to me like Pokemon that have the same niche. So perhaps it's something different. Sandshrew are almost really good at dealing with Ekans. They're ground type, which of course is good against poison, but they have no ground moves. They have Poison Sting, alluding to the idea that they may be poison type, but they're of course not. So it's probably not that Ekans avoid Sandshrew, unless Sandshrew have lost the traits which make them threats to Ekans in the past. Alternatively, I think that Ekans may make use of empty Sandshrew burrows as homes. Sandshrew migrate away after yellow for their own reasons, leaving vacant holes in the ground, which Ekans make use of. That could cause this migration coordination we see, but I'm not 100% convinced on that. So that was a nice little bunch of three areas. Uh, this might take a while. It'll hopefully speed up over time, as the biggest brunt seems to be introducing new Pokemon, which there were a lot of in these areas. I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going to go next for the next set of areas, so if anyone has any thoughts on that, you can put them in the comments. And in general, I appreciate any comments. I read at least all the ones that YouTube tells me about. And this is a big interpretive project, so I'm interested in hearing other people's thoughts on things. But anyways, thank you very much for watching.